Next time you go and lie out in the sun, be sure to use some of this. Because what you'll be doing is lying out in the glow of a nuclear reactor. A distant one, but a nuclear reactor nonetheless. The sun is a star and its center is fusion heat, millions of degrees, pouring out day after day. And today we're taking two journeys. One is to the center of the sun. And the second journey is back to three minutes after the start of the universe, when the whole of the universe was at the temperature that the sun's centre is today. Now at this point you might say, how on earth can you tell me how hot the sun is? After all, I can't go and put a thermometer in it. Well, come with me and I'll show you. We can look at the sun and we can see it glowing in the sky and we see the beautiful colours that it gives us. Now colour is a great hint to what's going on. Things that are very hot glow right across the spectrum. The hottest things glow blue and cooler things grow yellow and the coolest things grow, glow in the red region. When you say red hot, in fact you should be saying red cool. It's the coolest of the whole of the rainbow. So just the action of looking at the sun and seeing it with our eyes, the beautiful colour of the sun, tells us the sort of temperature of its outside. Now what we're going to do here in the room is to make ourselves a sun of our own. Bryson over here has got an oven inside which he's going to put a cannonball. Now don't open it up yet, I'm going to tell you what to look for. That cannonball is up over a thousand degrees and the moment he opens the front it'll be glowing yellow. Now the moment he brings it out from there it'll start cooling so fast you'll see it change from yellow to orange to red almost before you can follow it. It will stay red and gradually cool off and you'll apparently see nothing at all when it's got cold. But it's not cold yet, it's actually very, very hot. Too hot to handle. But it'll be glowing in the infrared. Now let's do the thing, look for the orange and yellow the moment it opens. Let's go. So a thousand degrees, you've got your glowing yellow ball, it's turning to orange already even as we've got it out into the air. It's glowing down towards the red end now still glowing red as it cools away and gradually it will cool further and move away from the red and become invisible to the eyes. But as it does that, although our eyes can't see it, it goes away from the visible spectrum with instruments we can pick it up. This is a thermopile, a special eye that can see beyond the rainbow into the red, into the infrared, measuring heat. <coughs> If I point this at the bench, nothing's really happening. It's quite cold down here. But if I point it up towards our sun, we see the thing shoot way, way up. It's detecting the heat into the infrared, even though this thing is rapidly disappearing from sight to our regular eyes. So we see here how the colour changes as it cools. Bryson, I think you'd better get that into the water fast. Hmm. Thank you. So we've got the idea now that different colours <laughs> tell us about the temperatures. Red is cooler than yellow, it's cooler than blue. We can go and look at the stars and see for ourselves exactly what they are. We can look at the Orion Nebula, new stars being born. And in the Orion constellation there's a red star which is quite cool and there's a blue star which is very hot. So we begin to see already the different temperatures of the stars just by looking at them from here. Now the Sun is our nearest star and we can do a lot with that. We can take a spectrum of the light that's coming from the Sun. 
Let's look at that. And here you see the beautiful rainbow right the way across. But in the middle of the rainbow, you see some dark lines. Now, this is like a thumbprint, an autograph. It's a spectrum that was showing up the presence of a new element, helium, in the outer regions of the sun. Now, all elements give you spectra. You can do them in the laboratory and measure them and start writing down what the spectra look like in a book. It's like fingerprints. So here, you've gone and looked at the sun and you found this fingerprint of something. What is it? You go and look in your book like the, the police do and they're trying to find the fingerprints of the criminals and you find this fingerprint isn't there. It's a new one. At that moment, people realised they had found the thumbprint of an element that nobody knew of before. And that's how helium was discovered. They called it helium because it was found in the sun. Helios, helium. So here you see how you can look out into space and see what's happening out there. What you have in effect done is gone out to the sun and put a test tube and brought it back home. You can compare the spectrum that you see here from the sun with a spectrum of helium that you could make here in the laboratory. Exactly the same. So what the stars are doing by shining at us and allowing us to look at them is like fax messages. They're telling us that out there in space, nature is doing the very same things that it does here in the laboratory. It's the same everywhere. So we can learn about the stars remotely all the way across space like this. But it raises now a very interesting question. If this was 1893, the RI lecturer 100 years ago would have got as far as he could go. Because we're now faced with the problem, how does the sun do it? How does the sun stay burning bright in the sky day after day after day for so long? Well, the first possibility is that it's a chemistry fire, just like the fire in the grate at home. It doesn't work. Lord Kelvin pointed out that if it was just chemistry at work there, 10 million years was the maximum time that the sun could have survived. Far too short for the whole of life on Earth to have developed. So that was the first possibility gone. The second possibility that came to mind then was gravity. Now everybody knows about gravity. We've known about gravity since Galileo and the pendulum. So let's actually demonstrate our confidence in gravity. Here I have another cannonball hanging on the pendulum and I'm looking for a volunteer who knows all about gravity and trusts me. Would you like to come down? Hi, it's your name? Julian. Right, now you're nice and short, good. Let's walk back over here. Keep walking back, keep walking back until this is over your head. Now, one more step back. Stand very still. Now what we have here is a demonstration of how you can convert one sort of energy into another. This is like being at the top of a waterfall. You've got great potential to turn into energy of motion, as I will reveal now by letting go of the pendulum. You see, it's turned into kinetic energy. It swings quite happily back, and I really believe in the laws of nature that it's safe as long as I don't move, I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> So that's gravity, we know how it works, we trust it. <laughs> but then we try to work out whether the sun could be generating energy this way. Could it be that the gases in the sun are collapsing under their own gravity and generating heat? Lord Kelvin did the sum for that as well. And he discovered that even that couldn't last at more than about 20, 30 million years. Now at this point you have a problem. You've got Darwin's theory of evolution, which was gaining credibility in the late 19th century, and according to that, the Earth was many hundreds of millions of years old. Yet according to these calculations, chemistry and gravity would have only allowed the Sun to have lasted for a much shorter time. What was going on? One possibility was that Darwin was completely wrong, that the time scales of geology were just completely wrong, and many people thought that was the explanation. 